Thank you. So good to be here this morning, isn't it? You know, I've run into a couple of people that have told me last week and this week, this is the first time in a year that I've actually been back to church in person. And I know that feels like a long time, doesn't it? And how many of you recently have just started to come back, feel comfortable coming back? Come on, let's give it up for everybody that feels comfortable. Welcome back. And again, we want to say that if you're watching online, we encourage you, if you have health issues, immunity issues, or don't feel comfortable, and of course, if you feel sick of any kind, please, we want you to stay at home, but we want you to participate. By the way, I'm super encouraged that quite a few people have told me, even though I wasn't here in person, every Sunday I was glued to that screen, worshiping together, raising my hands in my living room, but it's so good to be here in person. And I wanna say it is opening up slowly and we thank God for that. Two quick announcements I wanna make and then we're gonna jump right into the word of God today. I wanna remind you that um, Easter is five weeks away. The Super Bowl of Christianity. It's coming at us fast. And I, I just remember last Easter. It was, well, we were preparing for our outreach. We were getting ready for it. And I remember coming to the empty parking lot and doing a little video. And my, ha- my heart was sad because for the first time that I can ever remember, we weren't gathering in person in our building, a packed out auditorium. But I remember saying in that video, hey, our parking lot is empty, our building is empty, but so is the grave of Jesus Christ empty as well. So we are <laughs> celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I want to remind you that for this Easter, we are having four services in the English and multiple in the Spanish as well, because we want to make sure that we can accommodate as many people as we can on Easter and still be safe. So we're going to have four services. We do have an Easter drama mixed in with the message that Pastor Josiah is going to be preaching. And uh, our Drama is called Last Chance, Last Chance. And so I want you to already start inviting friends and family members. It'll be a great occasion to celebrate an Easter back. The other thing I just want to acknowledge as well, and I know you've heard a lot about it, but let me just echo it. We continue to feed thousands of people every week through New Life Community Church. Here at our Midway campus, we do it once a month. And so next Saturday, there'll be hundreds of cars and people that'll show up. And uh, we need volunteers. It's a lot of work, truckloads of food. But there are people that are still very, very much hurting because of this pandemic. Our little village location, by the way, is active uh, distributing food three days out of the week. This past week, listen, this past week, They fed 10,000 people. That's, hey, that's, I'm talking one week here. And you know what? I love it. We don't do it for the applause of men or people or recognition of others. But I love it when the world and the city starts realizing, hey, look what's happening there. I was just told that the mayor of Chicago, I, I guess this Tuesday is the birthday of Chicago. The mayor of Chicago is actually showing up at our food pantry to celebrate the birth of Chicago. And I love when people from the world start saying, hey, look what's happening there at these places where God is working. So I want to say thank you for being a part of making a difference, praying for people, meeting people's needs, encouraging people that are depressed and continuing to have celebrate recovery, breaking addictions during this time, uh, reaching out to the elderly and helping them during a very difficult time. This church has been amazing to watch in the middle of a pandemic, and I'm so proud to be a part of New Life Community Church. Would you stand with me? As we get into the Word of God today, I want to acknowledge that this is not just a religious gathering. 
It's not about music and community and worship, although those are important. It's about the fact that the presence of the living God is here. This is not an ordinary gathering. It's an extraordinary gathering because there's a spiritual presence and a power. The Bible tells us that when we come together, two or three gather in his name and we invite his presence that God is able to work and move in us. We are body, soul, and spirit. I'm praying that the spirit of God present in this place would speak to people and that you would know that it is God that has spoken to your heart and stirred your heart. In fact, I'm praying that, that whatever issues you came in with, whatever discouragement may be battering your soul, whatever doubts you may have, whatever loneliness you may experience, whatever disillusionment you may be going through, that you would sense the spirit of the living God supernaturally speaking to those issues and that you would know God, God is the one that's doing this, not man, not a church, but God. So let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you are here. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would minister deeply to the souls of people today that need to know your reality, your presence, your embrace. I pray for that person that just needs to know you're real today, God. I pray that you would nudge them in such a powerful way that they would walk away again with their faith revived. I pray for that person that's confused today that you would give clarity I pray for that person that's disheartened, God, that you would speak encouragement the way that only you know how to do, Father. I pray for healing. I pray for salvation. I pray for reconciliation. More than anything, I pray that you would be present and that your son Jesus would be lifted in this place. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So if you have your Bibles here or smartphones, get in your smartphone. Just don't be distracted by Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever you may be distracted. Let's go to the Word and stay in the Word. How about it? Um, but you can, uh, you can look at your passage on your smartphone if you have one or in your physical Bible, and we're turning to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to be reading out of uh, verses 1 through 11. We're studying through the book of Philippians, and the series is entitled Becoming. I've entitled this message, Thinking That Kills Your Joy. You know, joy and confidence our cousins. When there's a sense of confidence, there's a sense of joy and vice versa. And I simply want to say that, um, you know, I, I read this saying recently, I thought it was interesting. It says, you know, confidence is what you have before you understand the situation. Have you ever been in a situation that you were pretty confident about, but you didn't fully understand? And then you realize, uh-oh, I remember uh, a while back, maybe two or three years ago, I decided that I wanted to grow out my beard. I, I've never really um, had a full, like, bushy beard. My dad did. He, I grew up, he always had a beard. So I figured, I'm going to grow it out. And so I grew out, grew out a beard, and it was, you know, nice and bushy. And, um, you know, the problem with the beard is that if you don't, if you're not careful you can get all kinds of things caught in it, right? After you eat, you have to like say, do I have any crumbs or any extra dessert in my beard? And so you have to watch it. So that's part of it. 
And I was at a restaurant uh, sitting down and someone that I wanted to meet was at the restaurant. And I thought, oh, here's my chance to meet. So I got up and I said, hi, how you doing? I'm talking to them. And I noticed they kept look, glancing down at my beard. I thought they're probably admiring what a great beard this guy has, you know, nice and bushy, full thinking, now oh, that's a great beard. And then my wife was beside me. She kept kind of looking over and then she said, excuse me. And she said, I just want to pull this food out of your beard there. And I realized he wasn't looking down at my beard because he admired it. He was looking down because I had a bunch of food in it. Confidence is what you have before you understand the situation. I believe that you need to listen to this message today because there are some people that have lost their joy. And you say, well, pastor, of course I've lost my joy. Have you listened to the news lately? I mean, what is there to be content, hopeful, or joyful about? No one quite knows when the pandemic is going to end. You may be struggling with a economic situation at your job that's not friendly to your career. We continue to wrestle through racial tensions in our nation. We've experienced one of the more political, volatile, and polarized election in our history. You say, I, my kids are at home online. They're driving me crazy. And I want to have joy, but I look around and it's hard for me to have joy because of my circumstances. And I want to tell you that the joy that comes from God is not circumstantially based. The joy that comes from God that I'm talking about is a kind of joy that's rooted in your heart and connected to the character of God, regardless of the environment around you. This is a joy that is not touched by circumstances. It's a joy that is above circumstances. In fact, the Bible says in Galatians that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, where the Spirit of God dwells strongly and deeply and powerfully in you, the manifestation or the consequence of having His presence in you is that there is a joy that's there. And so if you've lost your joy, here's what I know about you. You lack energy to solve the current day problems because joy produces energy. If you lack joy, I understand that your view of the future has been clouded and gray. If you lack joy, I also understand that you live with a cloud of gray semi-depression about you. If you lack joy, it's hard for you to engage in relationships in a healthy way because um, your lack of joy makes people around you feel like bigger problems than what they are. If you lack joy, I understand that you are not living with the full understanding of the presence of God in your life. So I hope that this message will help some of you regain your joy. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of people that are in the town of Philippi. The word joy is found 17 times in this letter that is written to the church of Philippi. And Paul is not writing this letter from Florida on Marco Island with his feet kicked up and a little umbrella in his drink, talking, absorbing the sunshine of Florida and talking about how we need to have joy. He's actually writing this letter from a prison, not knowing his future, in fact, facing possible execution. And yet the, the, the book, the letter that he writes is about how to become what God has called us to become during this season and not lose the joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. And so he enters into chapter three. Now chapter four that Pastor Josiah is gonna be talking about next week uh, is, is 
more the standard uh, teaching on not letting anxiety get a hold of you, what to do with your mind, and that's going to be a powerful message. This has to do with our relationship with God, our theology. Theology is the study of God, and it affects the way we view God, the way we view life, the way we view our circumstances, and so we're going to jump into it. Four ways to replace wrong thinking and maximize your joy. Verse 1 says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Finally, he says. And he's like most preachers, I guess. He says, finally, and then he goes two more chapters. You've heard me say, and to conclude, and then I go on and on. Finally, he says, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. You know, as he's saying, hey, this is, this is a joy I'm calling you to have in God. This is a kind of spirit of gladness that I want you to have in God. A kind of joy that brings energy, but it's found in God. Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, if you're going to... If you're going to replace wrong thinking and maximize your joy, first of all, watch out, listen, watch out for teaching that builds confidence through religious systems or the work of man. Watch out for wrong teaching. The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of people that have experienced God in a fresh new way. They were caught in a religious system and they experienced the reality of God that got them out of that religious system and now they're tempted to be dragged back into the religious system they came out of. Can I tell you this? You can be very, very, very religious and very, very, very far from God. How many of you know that? How many of you were very religious at one time, but very far from God? Raise your hand if you were. Religion in and itself does not mean that you are close or right with God. Because religion, if not careful, can be based on works and ethics and systems that put all the weight on us And its focus becomes man instead of God. And a lot of people that I talk to have a wrong view of Christianity. I talk to people that say, well, I tried Christianity. It didn't work. And see, I believe that you may have have tried a watered down man focused version of Christianity But true Christianity, rooted in God, brings about life transformation. Christianity that is a religious system leads to what Paul is talking about here. And he says to them, listen, it is no trouble for me to write the same things again to you. How many of you know that some truths need to be repeated over and over? You say, yeah, I have a teenager. I know what that means. Got to repeat the same things over and over. But there's some truths that have to be repeated over and over. Why? Because those truths are so vital to our understanding of God that they have to be repeated over and over. And he said, he says, it's no trouble for me to repeat these same things again. And in fact, it's a safeguard for you. In other words, I'm protecting your joy and your theology by repeating this to you again. He says, watch out. This is a word of warning. When we see the watch out, it means, uh, you know, it's like uh, in the subway of New York City. I I remember uh, seeing watch your step, the sign, watch your step and, and signs. What it's saying is that, hey, if you miss this step, you could fall on the train track. Watch out. It means if you if you're not careful, this could lead to damage. So the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm repeating this warning again to you because if you don't 
if you're not careful, this could damage your life. And so I want you to watch out. This is take caution. There's a caution tape here. Notice what he says. Watch out for those dogs. You say, oh, was he protecting against wild dogs and canines? No, he's not talking about four-footed animals here. He's actually using strong language to refer to teachers, religious teachers, that were dragging people back into a religious system that was robbing their joy. This is strong language. Watch out for dogs. Those men who do evil those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Let me break this down to you. What was Paul so passionate about to warn these people about? The Apostle Paul was warning these people about a religious form of teaching that causes people to go under a weight of condemnation that they not, cannot carry on themselves. I've, I've been around religious people sometimes in certain religious settings that because of the weight that they have to carry on themselves because of wrong teaching, there is no joy in their worship. Have have you ever been around that? Have you ever been in a setting where the worship, you went to a religious service and it felt a bit like a funeral? And if you were to walk in, everybody is like really, and you think people must have drank lemon juice this morning because no one smiles, no one's happy. It almost is like you have to put this, and I've even seen it in the old paintings in churches. You know, it it seems like the more religious you are, the more it's like. Like that was the religious face. The religious face is like, I'm in pain. Like, I want to say, do you have an ingrown toenail? What's going on there? Because, but, but, but it's like the more religious you are, there's the, there's the thought that religious people are sad people, that religious people have this sense of almost like, like pain that, that the more religious they are, the, 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 the less happy that they seem to be. Can I just debunk a myth? When you know what God has done, when you know how he's forgiven you, when you know his goodness, when you know his sovereignty, when you know his mercy, when you know his grace, you cannot avoid the joy and gladness that comes from the good news of the gospel. Listen, it's called the good news, not the bad news. Joy, I have... seriously, I've had some people come in to me and say, Pastor, you know, I, I, I visited the church this morning and it's different. I said, what do you mean? Well, you know, people clap and they raise their hands and they laugh and they, are we supposed to do that in church? I think the people of God should be the most celebratory people on earth. I think we have more to be glad for, more to rejoice for. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Over and over in Scripture it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout, sing, rejoice, be glad. For the tomb is empty, our God is risen, and He is sovereign. So I just want you to know that it's okay to rejoice in church because we have a lot to rejoice for. And again, I've used this before, but I have men occasionally tell me, well, Pastor, I'm just not emotional. I just, you know, I'm not like a hand waver. I'm not like a singer. You know, I just am not, I'm kind of reserved. Oh yeah, and I've seen you at the Bears game. (laughs) And you have your shirt off and you have stuff painted and your face and you're screaming, jumping, shouting. And you say, well, I'm no, no, no. You're just not excited about Jesus. Once you get excited about Jesus, you're going to be, hey, you're going to be super charged up about the goodness of God as well. So let me clear that out of the way first. So he says the 
So he, he, he talks about, and what is he talking about here? What is, the, what is the teaching that is so dangerous that he talks about? Well, let me say that he, he mentions uh, that we are to be careful about these people that are religious people, but that are teaching us the wrong thing. He calls them mutilators of the flesh. He calls them dogs. He, but, but what is he talking about? And then he goes on and he says, for, for it is we who are the circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So what was happening with the people that have come to know Jesus, come to know God, is that they had experienced the joy of forgiveness, the good news. But people had come in amongst them and it started to try to bring them back into the old system, uh, the, the old condemnation, the old religious uh, heavy weight of trying to live to a standard that none of us can live by, that only Jesus can produce in our lives. And so, and so in the Jewish culture, a sign of being part of the chosen people, it started with Abraham. <coughs> uh, you can find it in Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 through 14. It, a sign that every, every male baby that was a part of the Abrahamic covenant that they call was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, circumcision is a ritual in which a, a piece of flesh is cut off the private of a little baby boy. And that, uh, that ritual symbolized that that little baby boy was a part of the covenant the chosen people of God. And so in the Jewish culture, one of the greatest insults that you could hurl at another man is you're uncircumcised. Do you remember the story of David and Goliath? David goes against this big guy called Goliath. And, you know, here's this little David fighting this big giant named Goliath. And, you know, there's a lot of things he could have said against Goliath. You big ox of a man. You're big but dumb and slow. I'm going to get you. But he, he looks at him and says, and you uncircumcised Philistine. Like, well, it's not your mama jokes. It's nothing like that. It's you uncircumcised Philistine. And you think, well, what kind of insult is that? Well, what he was saying with that is you are not a part of the chosen people of God. You are not, hey, you are a pagan. And it was an insult to say that, to, to, to call someone uncircumcised. Listen, the Jewish believers at that time, the people of the law were coming into the people that have experienced grace and they were making them feel a weight of condemnation upon them. They were taking the law of the Old Testament and they were imposing it upon these believers that had just experienced the grace of God and goodness of God. And they were saying, yeah, you found Jesus, but here's all the other rules that we put on your shoulders to make you right with God. And the Bible says that Paul is saying it's not, you don't get right with God out of a physical act of circumcision. This is, you are circumcised in your heart. This is a spiritual act in which you become a part of the covenant people of God, the chosen people of God. And we worship God by the spirit, Holy Spirit of God. And we glory in Christ Jesus, not and put no confidence in the flesh. Are you tracking with me so far? This is really important. Let me translate. Most of us don't come from a Jewish background, so sometimes it's hard for us to understand this. Let me translate it into our culture. Some of you come from a religious background in which you, were, you felt like you were made right with God by the deeds that you did, by the prayers that you prayed, by the alms that you gave, 
by the confessions that you made. And so some of you would count the number of times that you prayed and you would feel like today I have to, I have to pray the same prayer 20 times and that will make me right. I have to do a ritual and a confession. I have to go to this service or that service. I have to give alms. And if I do enough, maybe I will be made right with God and maybe I won't have to suffer uh, purification penance, purgatory, whatever you want to call it, to be right with God. And so you live constantly, you've lived your constant life feeling like I'm a sinner that doesn't measure up to the standard of God, and I hope that when I die, I make it in, but there's a good chance I might not make it in because I have so much garbage on my life. I fall so short in my life, and when you're doing really good, you get pumped up with pride, and you are self-righteous to those that aren't doing good, and when you're doing bad, you feel full of condemnation. I'm going to hell anyway, so I might as well live however I want because I can't measure up, and millions of people in this country live that way. So when they walk into church, they don't walk with their head lifted up. They walk with their head down with condemnation, completely aware of their falling short in front of a holy God. Here's what I want to say. We are unworthy. We do fall short. We have not measured up. We can never measure up. That is the point of a savior. If we could measure up, if we could be good enough, if we could meet the standard of holiness, if we could have our good works outweigh our bad works, then G there would be no necessity for a Jesus. But because we can't, because there is no other way, because there is none righteous, no, not one, because we all fall short of the glory of God, that's why Jesus had to come. The point of Jesus is that none of us can make it. The point of Jesus is that we've all fallen short. And you tell me, Pastor, hold on. Are you saying that there's not a good person on the face of this earth that on their own power could make it to heaven or be right with God on their own? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. And I didn't make it up. The Bible says that. There is none righteous, no not one. There is none that measures up. There's none that's holy. There's none that. But I don't know what you think. And you say, hey, Pastor, what about Mother Teresa? I've told you this before, but let me, just, let me just use this illustration that I've heard in the past. Let's take Mother Teresa, for example. Let's say that Mother Teresa was doing very, 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 very good. And let's say that Mother Teresa only sinned three times a day. That's really good. That means that she didn't get angry, that jealous. In her mind, she didn't sin, or, she didn't, or there weren't things that she was supposed to do that didn't do. She wasn't selfish. She wasn't prideful. Say three times a day. That's a very, very good person. Well, do the math. In, in a year, that's what? How, how many times? Come on, we all went to public school here. I can tell. No one's like, ah, over my calculator. All right, so that's close to a thousand times. And let's say that Mother Teresa would die when she, I forget, but say Mother Teresa dies at, at you know, 70 years old, and you say, well, she's been a very, 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 very good person. Well, she's going to stand before God and say, hey, God, I've been so good, I only have 70,000 sins that I've committed. So what is your standard, God? And the Bible says that God's standard is perfection. That, no, that, that be, to stand before a holy God, we must be perfect. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is impossible for us to be perfect. None of us can be perfect before God. And that is why our confidence is not in our good works before God. Our confidence is at the foot of the cross of Jesus where we say, I need a savior because I cannot save myself. It's about what he has done for me, not about what I can measure up to do for him. That's called grace. 
There are people under condemnation right now living year after year after year after year trying to earn their way to God and they can never pay a debt that's too great for them to pay. They'll never be able to pay it. It's too great. It's too good. But yet they strive and they lose their joy because they're trying to be moral, trying to be good, trying not to sin. And they sin and they fall and they, without understanding that there's someone that has come to pay the price, his name is Jesus. And that's why the Bible says, who glory in Christ. Why would we glory in Christ? We glory in Christ because he's done the work. We glory in Christ because it's all about what he has done for us, not what we can do, not what we can do to measure up to him. Who glory in Christ and put no confidence. How much confidence do we put in our own flesh? No confidence in the flesh. I'm talking about regaining your joy. Number two. Not only do you have to watch out for thinking that takes credit from that which belongs to Jesus, number two, eliminate any self-reliance that competes with the work of Christ. Notice what it says in verse four. Though I myself has re have reason for confidence. Now, Paul is gonna argue how religious he is. And he's there to tell you, hey, I've been so, it's, he's like giving us his religious resume. He's basically saying, if anybody has been religious, I've been religious. If anybody has been an outstanding keeper of the law and uh, the Jewish law, it's me. Notice what he says. If anyone else, anyone else thinks that he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for de zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's he telling us? He's telling us, hey, if you believe that your religious resume is going to be good enough to get you in with God or get you into heaven, and you think that your res resume is good, the Apostle Paul says, hey, my resume is probably better than yours. It's somewhat facetious. He's telling, hey, I have a great resume. And in essence, he says, although my resume is great, I fall short, no matter who's right. And so he's talking to a Jewish audience and he's telling them how good his resume is. What does he say? Circumcised on the eighth day. Now, if you were a Jewish child, you were supposed to be circumcised, not on the seventh day, not on the ninth day, but on the eighth day, a good Jewish family. The Ishmaelites, whose blood was mixed, they were Jews. They were circumcised when they were 13, so not on the eighth day. He says, and by the way, I was, I'm, an, I'm ethnically Jewish, he says, of the tribe of Benjamin, because there were several different tribes there. And by the way, he came from an honored tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, who gave Israel its first king. A Hebrew of Hebrews. In contrast to a Greek-speaking Jew, he came from a family that had retained the Hebrew customs and that spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. It's like families that come from your native country. And, you know, I've heard people say once in a while, um, you know, and I know that because my wife is second generation Mexican, came from Michoacan, doesn't speak English, but was born there. And my kids are half Mexican, half uh, Caucasian or whatever I am. And um, <laughs> half mutt or whatever I am, I got to still do the DNA testing, figure out exactly what I am. And... Um, so people will say, people will say, oh, so yeah, you have Mexican background, but how Mexican are you? That means you speak Spanish, you, you know, do you do the food, do you do the, you know, and, and the Apostle Paul is saying, oh, I'm like really Hebrew. You know, there's some families that have the last name, but I'm really Hebrew. We speak Aramaic in our house and we have the customs of the, the Hebrew people. And in regard to the law, he said, I was a Pharisee. Now in the Jewish tradition, there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the body, but the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection in the body. They were one of the most strict religious groups. In fact, when they went to tithing, which means giving 10%, they would actually 
look at their spices on their spice cabinet and they would take their their uh, th- their, their spices, their mint and dill and their cinnamon or whatever spices they use. And they would say, okay, 10% goes to God, 90% goes to me. They would fast regularly. They would pray in the streets. They, would, they were very concerned about the outward appearance. If a woman came in, they were like, hey, you can't do this. We have to dress like this. We have to pray like this. They were very legalistic. They had hundreds of laws that they followed in their religion to make them right with God. And what the Apostle Paul says, I did all of that to the nth degree. But it was nothing. But whatever was profit, I now consider it loss for the sake of Christ. What he's saying is, I was ultra religious, but it was nothing because I didn't have Christ. What the Apostle Paul is telling, you can fall under the banner of Christianity and be a zealous person in your religious background and miss the whole point of Christianity, which is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ that's focused on his work for and through us. We are all created by God, but we are not all born of God. In John chapter 3, Jesus spoke with a Pharisee called Nicodemus who was interested in a conversation with Jesus and he met him at night because he was afraid that other people would see him with Jesus. And Nicodemus, this Pharisee, very religious person, says, what must I do to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus says to him, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, born again? I'm an old man. I got to get back inside my mother and be born. Nick, Nick, please, please. Don't even crazy talk. And Jesus said, no, what is born of water is water, was born of spirit is spirit. You must be born again. What Jesus told Nicodemus is that you are created by God, but there has to come a point in time in your life where there is an act by which you invite the Spirit of God to come into your life, you surrender because you realize you can't save yourself, and the Spirit of God comes inside of you, and that Spirit of God, as you repent and believe, comes inside of you and regenerates you into a new person, and that's what it means to be born again. Now listen to me well. You can be around Christianity and not be born again. You can be a church person and not be born again. You can learn the culture of Christians You can learn the verses. You can come here for years and know when to stand and sit and maybe even get comfortable enough to raise your hand. You know, some of when you were to start, you start like this. Then you get like this. Then you go like this. You can learn the lingo of hallelujah. You can realize that in church, everybody calls themselves bro or sis. And so you start saying, hey, brother, hey, sister. Partly because we're family, partly because you can't remember people's names, but that's all right. You know, hey, bro, hey, sis. And, and, and you can learn the culture. You can learn the songs. You can learn to pray. Listen, but just because you're around Christianity does not make you a Christian. Just because you learn a culture does not make you a Christian. You must be born again to be a Christian. So it's about an internal transformation 
It's not about morality and religion. It's about a spiritual transaction that changes the destiny of your life in which the Holy Spirit comes inside of your life, turns you around, you repent, you believe, you accept the message, and a spiritual transaction happens in which you are no longer living for yourself. You are no longer in control of your life, but God is because you've surrendered to his lordship and the process of transformation that we call sanctification begins to occur within your life. You must be born again. Number three, reconsider what is truly important and what is excess baggage. Verse eight says, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in God and is by faith. The second thing that the Apostle Paul, and again, he kind of is repetitive in his message, and since I'm preaching verse by verse, I'm going to be a little bit repetitive as well. By the way, when you come to this church, I try to preach the Bible verse by verse, what we call exegetical teaching, which means I take the passage, I break it down, I put it in its context, and I try to teach you what the original meaning and content of the Bible is, which I believe is the best way to teach the Bible. And just because someone preaches from the Bible doesn't always mean they're preaching the Bible as it was meant. How many of you know you can pull one verse out, put it in your context, spin it, and try to make it say whatever you want it to say? But if you preach the Bible in context, verse by verse, understanding the context and the flow of it, then you're able to give sound teaching, and that's really important. Just because a church has the word Christian on it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting solid Christian teaching. I bless other churches, and I cooperate with other churches, but I want you to understand that you need to make sure you study scripture in its contents. Hello? Okay. So he says, what is more, I consider everything lost. What loss? All of the religious stuff that I was doing, he says, it's nonsense. It doesn't make me closer to God. I consider it loss. Compared to what? Compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What he's saying is, I had religion in the past, but the essence of Christianity's relationship, not religion. If you have a religion or a culture of religious thinking, but have no powerful relationship with God through Jesus, then you have nothing. But a system of morality the ultimate goal of God from creation all the way from Genesis was not to make people more religious. The ultimate goal of God was that man was separated from God through our sinfulness. There was a wide separation. It's called the fall of man. Every human being born since Adam has been born with a sin nature. That sin nature brings the proclivity to separate us from God for us to do our way, our own thing. We need salvation, every single one of us. The goal of God since creation has been to reconcile man to himself, overcoming this great barrier that we call sin so that we can walk in the holiness of God. It's reconciled reconciliation between man and God. The law came to teach us the standard of God, but the law also taught us that no one, no one can measure up to the standard of God. And we understood through the law that we need a savior because none of us can make it on our own. That savior had to be a savior that was perfect, had, that had no sin, that had, that was and the only way to have no sin and be perfect was he would have to be God. So the second person of the Godhead named Jesus the Christ was incarnate and born on earth through a virgin so that the sin nature would not be passed down to him. He lived a sinless, perfect life for 33 years and died on a cross for the purpose of allowing you and I to have access to God through what he has done on the cross. I just gave you the gospel. And 
And so the, the apostle Paul says, all the religious stuff I consider rubbish. We don't use the word rubbish too much these days. It sounds kind of English, doesn't it? Well, that's rubbish. It means dung, refuge, manure. And there's several other more crass words that I will not use in church, but it means that. And he says, I consider all that nothing that I may gain Christ and listen and be found in him. Let me pause for a moment there. Not having a righteousness that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in God and is by faith. Let me say this. He says that I may be found in Christ. I want you to know that you can be around Christ and not be in Christ. How many of you know you can go to the gym and be around the gym, but not really in the gym? Some people get the outfit, the matching water bottle, the hairpins, the exercise app. And then you go to the gym and you hang out talking with people chatting and you do one little exercise and say, okay, I've been, you're not really in the gym. You're around the gym. You got the gym work, clothes and workout. Or you can be around the pool, but not in the pool. You get the bathing suit. You get the suntan lotion. You're in there and someone said, oh, did you go to the pool? Yeah, I was in the pool. No, you weren't in the pool. You were around the pool, but you never actually got in the pool. And what, what, what the Apostle Paul is saying is, I consider that all rubbish so that I may be in Christ, not around Christ, not associated with Christ, not a sympathizer with Christ. Don't confuse the fact that you list Christianity on your Facebook as your religion of choice that makes you a Christian. It doesn't. You can be around Christ and not in Christ. You can be around the religion of Christianity and not be a Christian. And that's the point that I'm trying to make here. It's a very strong, important point. And if you're not a Christian, you lack the joy. Or if you're a Christian and you're under the, the assumption that the work of Christ is not sufficient, that you have to earn or merit your salvation, then you're going to live your life with little joy because you always feel condemned. Can I tell you this? If you are a believer that submitted your life to Christ, if you are a son or daughter of Jesus Christ, if you've been born again, here's what Romans tells us. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You say, Pastor, what are you telling me that if I become born again, I can go out and live however I want and do whatever I want and it's okay? No, what I'm telling you is that once you want come to Christ, if you're truly a follower of Christ, you won't want to do whatever you want to do because you want to live for God. You want to please God. You don't, listen, you don't steal not because you don't want to. You don't steal because you love Jesus and you want to live out what it means to be a son or daughter of the Most High God. You live for God not because you're trying to earn your way to heaven. You live for God because you're a son or daughter of God and it's part of your nature to do that. You want to live for him, love him, follow him. You come to church not because I got to go to church. Some people do this. I got to go to church. And then they get a flat tire. They say, I knew it. I didn't go to church. I got a flat tire. Almost like God is like keeping score. You do one for me, I'll do one for you. You hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you back. That's not the way it works. That's religion, not relationship. I have three kids, 28, 27, and 22 year old. We've been through our patches, especially during the teenage years. There were some intense times, but I'm going to tell you, there's nothing they can do once they are born of my blood. I was at their birth, believe me. I was at their birth. <laughs> and I, and after every birth, I say, thank you, Jesus, that I'm not a woman. I don't know how my wife did that. Wow, that is intense labor. But I tell you, 
Once they're born of me, we can have strain in our relationship. Things can happen, but they're my sons or daughters. And, 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 and if something happens where our relationships is tense, they're still my son and daughter. There's nothing they can do to not be my son and daughter. And, and they want a relationship with me because I love them and they love me. And that's the way it works. And that's the way it is with our father. You are not trying to live out your Christianity to earn your salvation. You, your life is changed because you are a son or daughter to the Most High God. You come to church because you want to worship Him and love Him, not because you're trying to earn points in heaven. Do you get it? It's the difference between relationship and religion. And Paul is making a strong, strong argument to these Philippian believers to don't get caught in a system of relationship where there, a system of religion where there's no authentic relationship. And he closes with this. And by the way, it's by faith, by faith. But that which is through faith in God and is by faith. The Bible says it is by grace that you are saved through faith. And this is not of your own, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is your capacity to believe the good news and believe enough to turn from the way you're living and embrace the way of God and allow him to change you from the inside out. You say, Pastor, well, what if I wanted to become a Christian today, but I just went out and got drunk last night and I got high and I slept with my girlfriend and can I become a Christian today? Or do I have to go through a self-improvement program to be admitted into the portals of Christianity? Let me tell you, there is no, re there is no prerequisite besides I believe and I'm willing to repent which means I believe enough that I'm willing to turn from the lifestyle that I've been living, embrace the way of God, and invite him to be Savior and Lord and let his transforming power change me from the inside out. There's no prerequisite, but when you come, you can't stay the same. Let me close with this. I want to know Christ, verse 10. Focus more on relationship with Christ and less on religion for Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death so that somehow I can attain to the resurrection of the dead. The apostle Paul is basically saying, I wanna, be, I, I wanna know Christ more, not become more religious. And as I know Christ more, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Can I tell you, can, can I be honest with you? you? You can read a lot of self-improvement books and you can improve yourself to a certain level, but you cannot change yourself like only God can change you. And what is the power that changes us? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, it's called the power of the resurrection, it comes in you and it empowers you to forgive people that you wanna hate. And it empowers you to break habits and addictions that you've never been able to break in your life. And it empowers you to love like supernaturally like you've never been able to love before. And it empowers you to change a heart that is hard to a soft heart of compassion it empowers you. Why? It's God at work in you. It's, it's the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. So when we glory, we don't say, hey, look how I've changed myself. If you, if that's your perspective and you say, hey, glory to be, me, to me, be to me. Praise be to me. Look how I've changed myself. You, you don't know Christianity. Christianity says, glory be to God. Praise be to Jesus. Thank you for the work that you've done in my life. It's you. Listen, listen, listen. Christianity's not praising a church or a pastor either. Can I say that? I want to say that I may be a spokesperson for the word, but never say, Pastor Mark, change me. I, I don't change anything. I can't change myself. 
I can't grow a hair on my head, literally. (laughs) The only power that you have coming from here is the power of the word, not the power of a man. It's the power of the word, the power of the word. God can use a donkey. He can use me. It's the power of the word. If you're changed, it's through the power of God, not the power of a man. If you've been redeemed, it's the power of the gospel, not the power of a church. God uses a community, but we are a broken group of people with our dysfunction and our issues coming together to serve a perfect God as imperfect people. And so, yeah, it's the power of God. I just want to be clear about that. Because sometimes preachers, teachers, leaders uh, uh, take on the glory that only belongs to King Jesus. And, and, and let us be clear that it's, it's the glory of God that deserves that. And the Apostle Paul says, being like him into his death, so somehow we may attain to the resurrection.